Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to day eight of the Ontario Coaches Conference in today's second session, a sum of averages, lessons learned from gymnastics to bobsled. A few housekeeping items for you before we get started. This session will run approximately till 3 p.m. You may also use the public chat on the right-hand side of your screen to ask questions. Those questions will be used for the Q&A at the end of the session. If you've got any time you need assistance, you can contact the CAO team by using the chat box in the bottom left corner of your screen that says Contact CAO. Today's session is being recorded and will be available for viewing within a few hours by uh, using the sessions tabs. Today, we are excited to have Brendan Cole, High Performance Manager with Athletics Ontario, leading today's session. His previous position was the start coach for the USA bobsled and skeleton team. In 2018, he was part of the training staff that coached the United States two women team to an Olympic silver medal. Brendan is an accomplished hurdler and represented his home country of Australia at the 2012 Summer Olympics in London. He was also part of the Australian 4x400 relay team that won the gold medal at the 2010 Commonwealth Games in Delhi. And with that, I welcome Brendan Clean. Over to you, Brendan. Have a great session today. Thanks so much, Jeremy. I really appreciate it. Uh, welcome to day eight, everyone. Um, I realize that uh, some of you might be a little bit tired, so I appreciate you all sort of sticking around for the last couple of sessions. Um, and I, I really wanted to give a shout out to CAO for making, uh, doing such a great job of, of, of building this, uh, this conference out. They've done a really good job with organizing some great sessions. And I hope that everyone's learned a lot for the process. I certainly have as well. Um, and secondly, I wanted to just acknowledge that this year's been really tough. It's been really tough for a lot of people, particularly coaches. So I acknowledge the fact that uh, a lot of you have had a pretty rough year. I haven't shouted to any coaches that have said, yeah, this year's been awesome. Everything went to plan. <laughs> so it's been a tough year and I wanted to acknowledge that and I appreciate everyone sort of coming together and trying to learn a little bit more. Um, so I guess my, my title and the title of this presentation could be a little bit, a little bit misleading. Um, because my high performance manager that I currently hold is not my most ex experience um, that I've been for the last 20 years of being in high performance sport. Um, and the title, I wasn't actually sure exactly what I was going to present when I first started. So it, it is somewhat and some of averages of all the things that I've learned throughout the, um, the multiple jobs and hats that I've worn throughout my career. Um, but really what I want to do is, is relate to you as coaches and trying to give you also a little bit more of the experience of the things that were really important to me as an athlete and as a therapist and as a coach and a manager. Um, hopefully give you guys some things to think about. Um, but with the fact that I have had most of my time has been spent in, um, in therapy and biomechanics, I'm really gonna focus on that today. Um, so a little bit on my journey, this is uh, the very windy road that got me to where I am um, today. Uh, I started off working uh, with Netball Australia. It was my sort of first high performance standing. I'd finished a, an undergrad in, in exercise science and went on to study um, therapy. And I really wanted to try and create an environment that was really ideal for the athletes that I was working with. I was able to travel with them, do um, two world championships. And the reason I did therapy was because it, it helped me um, fuel my, my career as an athlete which really uh, culminated in, in the London 2012 games. And, and I had such an incredible experience and I was so supported through that process. I was actually really keen uh, to leave the sport and to start working because I, I saw so much benefit in what support staff do for athletes to reach their goals and to see these athletes. And, and I was obviously one of them reach these heights was, was such a beautiful thing. And I wanted to be a part of that. So I was training and working at the Australian Institute of Sport and uh, main role there was as a therapist initially. I moved into um, movement education and I studied Pilates for a couple of years uh, and I was really inspired by a, a, a practitioner that I work with, Ari, and he was a martial arts guru and you won't find him anywhere on social media. He sort of floats around and, and he really started to, to change the way that I talked about movement 
and I really was inspired by that and, and that sort of got me into different sports and different movement patterns and that's where gymnastics came in and I was able to work with them for a few years as a, as a massage therapist as well and, and started to really kind of understand movement in a different way and I was really inspired by the incredible things that these gymnasts were doing. Um, my passion was, 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 is, and always has been track and field. And, and so I wanted to continue that. So went back to Athletics Australia and, and worked as a, a, a movement specialist and a, and a soft tissue therapist um, for their world championships team in 2014. Um, I then decided that I wanted to make a big move. And so I moved to the US and that was where I got the opportunity to work in for, for two different organizations. One was Altus down in Phoenix, a really high level track and field environment for, um, for for athletes and, and with the USA bobsled and skeleton team which was mentioned by Jeremy and and that was where I started to really see things that I hadn't seen before in Australia I started to see things that I, I didn't even know existed and and that just built in opportunities and I was able to work with the Norwegian skeleton team as well I worked with an Olympic gold medalists um, from from that sort of uh, from that country and all along the way I was really just trying to ask more questions and really trying to find new ways to help the athletes that I was working with and that brings me to my current job which is, is uh, manager of high performance at Athletics Ontario so a very windy road and I feel incredibly lucky and privileged to be able to work in so many different high performance environments and different sports with different hats on um, and so on that I, I, I feel like it's important to, to sort of put things in context a little bit and this is a quote and, and a picture that really, I guess, inspired me and, and plagued me a little bit as well, because um, the, the figure on the left is what's called the circle of competence. And essentially, it's this idea that we think we know a, a certain amount, but what we actually know is, is much smaller than what we think we know. And I was always trying to expand that little yellow circle and get more into the red and not to even mention the fact that there's so many things that we don't know we don't know. So I, I was asking a lot of questions. I was trying to find people that were way better than me at what I did. Um, and obviously going through the formal education of you know, Pilates and massage and, and a master's in sports science, that sort of thing. Um, but this quote really, really stands true for, for that whole process. And I know that I'm not a genius, um, but I'm pretty smart in spots. And I found that when I started, stayed in those spots and tried to expand them just a little bit at different times, uh, I was able to help the athletes that I work with um, significantly. So really when it comes down to daily training environments for athletes um, and performance as well as injury, it, it really can be pulled down into four different pillars of performance. So the performance pillars that, that, that I feel like are the most um, easy to understand are these four here. Um, so there's therapy, there's biomechanics and mechanics, there's lifestyle and there's programming. Now as coaches, most of the time we really sort of spend, we spend a lot of time in this programming space. We'll obviously try and have a, a positive impact on mechanics. Um, we don't really talk too much in, 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 around therapy, which I really want to do today because I feel like it's an important conversation for coaches to have. Um, and I'll try and share some of my insight. And then the lifestyle is, you know, everything off the track. So diet, um, sleep, um, how will they sort of uh, negotiate relationships, all the things that stress the athletes basically off the track. And really when it comes down to at the end of the day and a performance, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a combination of these four factors and these four pillars. And, I'm sure you've all had experiences where you've, um, you've, you know, you're scratching your head going, oh my God, well, why did that happen? Why, why did the athlete not perform as well as I thought they would? Or why did they get injured? And, or whatever it might be, there's, you know, there's so many moments we have as coaches where we're sort of not quite sure exactly what's happening and really can be brought down to, to uh, uh, looking at, at one of these four uh, or, or a combination of these four sort of pillars. Um, but as I said today, I'll really be focusing on the top two. Um, I'll start with therapy and then we'll talk a bit more about sort of mechanics and the things that I do as a coach um, to help the athletes that I work with. So my therapy kind of journey really started with a question. Um, and it was a question that came out of, of me being an athlete. And um, it's this question here, why did my doctor get it so wrong? And, and it was after an injury that I had, I was sort of in that, that sort of... Uh, really tenuous part of an athletic career where I was doing quite well. I didn't know much about what I was doing and not right and wrong. And I had this knee injury and, and the knee injury was, was treated for about a year and a half, almost two years. I had surgery on it. It was 
basically a, a tendon injury of the of the medial hamstring or the inside hamstring. And even after surgery, six months later, I, I, I was still not able to sprint. And I remember finding a therapist who was actually a lecturer that I was working um, with at Victoria University. And I knew he was a really good therapist and I asked him to help me out. And when he started treating me and assessing me, he went straight to my hip and he started working on my hip. And I said, Stu, it's my knee, my knee's a problem here. And when I got off the table, I had the least amount of pain I'd had in, in, in almost two years. And it just blew my mind. And I just wanted to know how he did that, what his process was and why my doctor who has got, you know, all these incredible degrees, how he could miss the fact that the inside of my knee was actually being caused by something on the outside of my hip. And so it started making me really think differently around anatomy and around how our body's connected. And I think this, this slide hopefully gives you a little bit of context of how I'm sort of started to think differently about anatomy. I'm, I'm sure for all of you have done some anatomy courses at some stage at different levels. And most of the time when we go to a textbook, we go to a lecture, we see the, the image on the right. We see these beautiful, nice, shiny muscles that have got very clear attachments and origins. And it's pretty straightforward. You know, it's got a function. It, it, it does a certain amount of work. It, it moves certain joints, etc. And it's simple, right? But the fact is that image on the left is way closer to the truth and the reality. And the fact is that anatomy is really, really complicated. And there's so much connectivity with fascia and connective tissue and all these tendons and things that connect different parts of the body. And the more I sort of started to think about anatomy differently, and I was uh, inspired by some comments of people that I work with. And one of those, one of those strong mentors for me was Dan Paff, who was one of the head coaches down at, uh, at Altus. And he, uh, he was an incredible therapist, um, even though he has no formal training. And he, uh, he kept telling me, Brendan, BJ, uh, you need to think about what else is there and where else can I look? And yes, you might have a knee injury, but where's that coming from? Have a look at the ankle, have a look at the hip, have a look at the T-spine or the shoulder. And the further away you can go from that side of injury, the more information you could potentially get around that athlete, how they move and why they're, they're feeling pain or injured in the first place. So that was a really important lesson for me as I started to expand and ask questions around why things weren't the way that I thought they were going to be. So then I started to think more about contextually where feedback and where this therapy sort of sits into the athletic training environment. And as I said, you know, sometimes coaches don't really get a chance or have an opportunity to think about this. Um, they might have someone in their, in their uh, training environment that already does this, or maybe they don't have anyone at all. But essentially, you know, this is a very simple diagram of, of how we tend to look at treatment and how it fits into the context of an athlete and athletic training environment. So at the top here, we've got the athlete, they do a training session. They might be a little bit hurt, a little bit tight, whatever it might be. Um, and then they go onto the table, they get treatment and they hopefully get back to training again. And this feedback loop could take minutes or it could take days. And I'm going to go through an example of that in a second. But what I started to realize in the different environments that I was in was how important the timing of that feedback loop was. And the smaller we can get that feedback loop, the more chances there are of the athlete adapting to the session, adapting to the therapy and getting back out there a lot more quickly. So I'm going to give you a bit of a hypothetical environment here. And it's not too far away from uh, what, um, what, what I've seen happen you know, in, in multiple times before. Hopefully everyone can see that the size of that font, it's okay. So let's, let's, let's say we've got two twins, completely identical athletes. Um, they're both doing a training session, same training session, and they both get through the session and they have some tightness in their hamstring. And it's enough for them to have a conversation with their coach and say, look, let's pull back for right now. Okay, so let's go to the athlete X on the left. Now this athlete has made that decision with the coach um, and they've actually got someone there at the track able to look at them, do an assessment, and do some therapy. So the person gets on the table and they do um, what we call trackside therapy. And that usually entails uh, being on and off the table. So we've probably spent about 30 minutes, you know, five minutes of treatment, go back out there and do a little bit of movement, get back on the table, see, what, see how that, that treatment and how that affected the movement. 
uh, and potentially go back and forth from doing that particular, uh, that, that, that format, that model. And then afterwards, they might not have been able to complete the full workout, but they've done a modified workout. Uh, I'll give you a, a really good example of this in a second. Um, because you've got the coach and the therapist there at the track together, they're able to collaborate. They're able to talk about what the workout structure should look like and how to move forward with that particular athlete. The next day they come back to the track, they have that preventative track side therapy, so something that's in their warm up before they get going with their workout and they're able to return to normal training because that feedback loop has been so small. So let's move across to athlete Y now. The same symptoms, same decision was made by the coach, but there's not a therapist there. So they've left the track, they go and do what they're supposed to do. They do some rest, ice, compression, a little bit of light stretching. Best case scenario, and, and this is, I think, probably uh, a, a, a good result with being to get back into a, a see a physio or a, a therapist within 24 hours. Physio will look at it. They'll do some work through the hamstring, probably give some rehab exercises, and then they tell the athlete to like, follow up in a, in a day. Like, let's test it out in the next session the next day and come back if you need to. Athlete goes back to train, still feeling the tension, and they go back to the physio. Physio does more treatment, a little more rehab, and then the next day they're, they're able to compete, uh, get back to normal training. Now, the difference there is one day of disrupted training compared to three days of disrupted training. And as most of you know, that time away from training and normal training environment is a huge factor in performance. So any chance we can get as coaches to create an environment where that disrupted training is reduced is a really, really important thing to do. And as I said, I know that most people here are, are coaches and we're here because we, we're talking about coaching, but the decisions that you make as a coach to set up the athlete in an environment where they can succeed is really, really important. So what does that ideal therapy environment look like? Um, the photo there of me with an athlete, uh, Curtis Mitchell, he's a 2014 200 meter national champion for the US, sub 20 second runner. Uh, he came into the program down at Altus. Um, he came in basically injured and he did compete that year and he, he did some competitions for those two years. But I can tell you right now, if, if, and I was sort of, he was my athlete, essentially, like I was, I was given, uh, given full reign of how to look after how to look after Curtis. And if I wasn't able to be there on the track every day for his training session, and we would go on and off the table, we'd do little bits of therapy, we'd do little, little parts within the workout to get him through. There's no way he would have been able to get through that. Not a chance in hell. Um, I think the second week that I got down to Altus, um, I was still just sort of observing and seeing how things, uh, how things worked and the model that they used there. And I saw uh, Aries Merritt, who's the current world record holder for the 110 meter hurdles, um, really fascial athlete, very sort of sinewy and tended to have lots of injuries through his hamstring. And he was doing a really fast speed workout. And um, on that day, he tore his hamstring, a very small grade uh, hamstring tear. And being from the environment that I'd been in before, I sort of said, okay, well, obviously the session's done. He's gonna go home and you know, we'll look at him the next day more like that athlete sort of wide on the right there from the previous slide. And I saw um, the, the head of physical therapy there, Jazz, and, and he did about 45 minutes of therapy on Aries. And Aries got out and actually did a workout after that, literally with a very small grade tear in his hamstring. Now I'm not saying that's the right way to go for everyone, but the fact is he was able to create a really nice plan B workout because he had that access to therapy right then and there on the table and at the track. So as I said, look, I realize that this is something that isn't always available for coaches, but there's always ways to kind of create these sorts of, sorts of environments. One of the things I often hear from athletes, from coaches, sorry, that, uh, you know, see this model of having trackside therapy, they say, you know, can't afford the therapist, um, can't afford someone to be there, don't have the expertise. And I really think that's, that's, that, that, that can be a, a different conversation. You may not be able to get the best therapist for the money and the, the budget you have, but a really good way of trying to find therapists that can be there at the track and help you out with your workouts, go to your local colleges, go to your Cairo schools, physio schools, massage schools, and see if there's anyone who really is passionate about sport, especially if, if, if there's a particular sport that they're interested in and that happens to be your sport, and ask them to come down, say, you know, 
I want you to learn more about this sport. I can teach you more about the mechanics of this sport. I can tell you more about what happens with the athletes and how they get injured, why they get injured. And there's always really good environments and opportunities for coaches to be able to create this really, really um, integrative environment for the athlete um, and the coach. Dan Altus, they call it the, 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 the basically the, the trinity, the holy trinity, if, if you like, of the athlete, the coach and the therapist. And the closer they are together in that env environment and the less there is time in that feedback loop, there's really just magic that happens. It's, it's pretty incredible what can happen when you've got everyone on the same page. Now, there's some people sort of look at this, uh, look at this model of having trackside therapy and having sort of access of therapy all the time. And they say, well, that really creates an environment where the athletes are dependent on treatment, that they need it to be able to work out. And that really comes down to the education piece. And um, uh, Altus have got some really good courses and I'll, I'll happily plug them because I went through it and it was a part of my life for a long period of time and I learned so much. But they've got some really good ways of teaching athletes the context of what they're doing uh, with trackside therapy. And it's not a massage, it's not something that they get every day if they don't need it, it's only when they do need it. And it really fits into that sort of Trinity idea of having good communication between coach, the athlete and the therapist. And there's some times where you want to step back, right? So there's some times where it's really important for you to just step back and watch the magic. Uh, I was lucky enough when I was down at Altus to be there for when Andre de Grasse was training there and uh, I had a bit to do with him as he built into the 2016 Olympics where he won uh, three medals. And it was an incredible experience to watch such a talented mover. Um, Go through, his, go through his process of training and see what such a really skilled mover can look like. And I don't know if any of you have seen Andre sort of train or run before, and this actually isn't the best rep for him. He's, he's holding some pretty poor positions, but it's a good example of one thing that he copped a lot of flack for and something that Stu and I talked a lot about. Stu was his coach at the time, which is his arm movement. He's got a bit of a funky arm movement, and it's certainly not you know what high school athletes get taught of what their arms should be in position. And, and I remember watching Andre before he came to Altus and I remember talking to Stu and saying, Stu, what's, what's our plan for Andre? Like, what's, what are we going to do here? And he basically said, don't screw it up. <laughs> and, and when I questioned him further about that, basically he was saying, you know, athletes like Andre, you keep this guy healthy, you keep him on the track, you keep him moving well, and he will, he will create magic. And I think there's a really important lesson in that when, we're talking about coaching or therapy because often we can do too much. You know, we, we, uh, Dan always talks about this idea of minimal effective dose. And I feel, I feel like that can be taken into therapy as well as to coaching. The minimal effective dose, just the right amount of input to get the desired result. Um, and certainly when you're working with very high end athletes that have got very, um, specific nervous systems and they've got really really high end levels of movement um, sometimes less is more in that sort of stage so let's shift a little bit now and move out of the therapy space and move a little bit more into the movement space um, and the biomechanics space and i wanted to sort of show you a, a little bit of, of of my priority and, and I think it's important for all coaches to have a very specific idea of what their priorities are. Um, this is my setup. This is the things that I feel are important and it's not going to be the same for everyone, but I know this fits into the model that I use to be able to coach the athletes that I coach. Um, and I think it's important for everyone to have their own sort of model with this. Now, keep in mind that this is not a, a slide or a graphic of, block periodization it's definitely not that it's not the strategy that i use um but it's really sort of what order in which i i, I prioritize things um so the first thing i definitely look at is mechanics and i'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that i look at um, from a mechanical point of view with the athletes that i work with and when we talk about mechanics um it really is around reducing injury and and increasing performance and at the end of the day, if they can't load their body well, there is no point in trying to build strength or build work capacity. 
Because if you don't have the mechanics, if you don't have good biomechanics, if you're not loading the structure in the body well, you're going to add bad patterns if you start working at strength, work capacity, especially if you try and get specific to the work you're doing. Now, as an athlete, I, don't, I didn't really talk about mechanics very much. I was lucky enough to have relatively good form um, naturally, but it wasn't something that was spent much time on. So I didn't really see the benefit of it until I saw all these coaches that were way better than me looking at athletes and seeing things that I couldn't see and like watching Dan and Stu and these guys work with athletes uh, and see things. I was like, wow, that, 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 that's incredible. And so I started to really try to, to emulate that and to see what are the, the most important elements of someone's mechanics. Now that change in mechanics, um, it could take a couple of days, it could take two months, and sometimes it even takes a year. And for me, I don't want to move on from the mechanic side of things uh, until I've got that established really well. Um, when I do have that, that's when you can load up with strength. Now they're gonna get some elements of strength with some of the, the drills that we do. As I said, I'll speak about them a little bit more in a second, but the specific strength to the movement they're trying to create, whether it be you know, bobsled gymnastics, um, sprinting, skeleton even, um, there's really no point in adding the specific strength until you've got the good mechanics in place. Once that strength is established, you can focus more on work capacity. And once that work capacity is there for the event and for the sport that you're looking at, that's when it gets more specific. And that's when that's when you can really start to see some of the, 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 the really cool things that you see when you've got an athlete working and moving really well. And as I said, I, it's definitely not a periodization strategy. This is just how I prioritize the athletes that I work with. So to get a little more granular on this, um, I think it's, it's important to understand that when moving well, and this is obviously the space that I work, work in most is with, with sprinters and you know, bobsled, skeleton, um, even gymnastics, they, they, you know, they all run. And there's not many sports that, that you know, we, we, we coach and we look at that, that don't have some element of running. Obviously there's some, but um, sprinting, speed, and power are, are all really important parts of most elements of sport. And so when I start working with athletes, um, one of the things, especially with athletes that come from team sports, they don't really understand the difference between acceleration and speed. And they're really quite, they're two quite different things. You want to ultimately have them come together in a, in a beautiful sprinting motion. Um, but the positions you hit when you're accelerating are different to the positions you hit when you're doing upright mechanics and top end speed. And what I always do when I start with is have that conversation with the athletes. And often when I'm periodizing and I'm working out a plan for the week or the month or the year, uh, I'll do one session that is themed purely acceleration and one session that's um, purely uh, themed as speed. And I think that's a really, really good thing to do for athletes. Sometimes you don't get a chance to do separate days, but even if you are doing both in the same day, giving the athletes the information that they need to know what they're doing has a huge, huge, huge benefit to what how they execute the session they're doing. Um, so you can see two athletes here. Uh, on the left, we've got Alison Felix. She's coming out of the blocks. She's showing a really nice acceleration stride. You can see by those arrows that she's leaning forward. Her projection angle is low. Um, and that mechanics is quite different to the right photo, which is Usain Bolt um, almost at full upright position. And you can see with that arrow and, and basically tracing his spine that he's more upright. Um, Examples of acceleration sessions on the left there, I'll often start athletes with a two-point position, so just sort of bent over. Um, once they're able to push out really well and hold good positions, I'll move to three-point and then to four-point if they're a sprinter. Um, wall drills where you're really trying to get that sense of pushing against something. And, you know, it, it, accelerating is very much you know a pushing motion. So doing wall drills, um, sled drags and prowler are another way of loading up that athlete so that they can get that context of pushing out. Examples of speed, um, drills, which I'll, I'll talk you through a couple of my favorites in a second. Um, dribbles are one of the drills that I do, a really good way of building sprint mechanics and upright mechanics. And we've got a position work um, and the wickets, which I'll show a really cool video of later in, um, in a few moments. But these, this is basically the two ways that I look at how an athlete moves really quickly. So where do we start with this? 
I usually start really simple. Um, so this is a walking drill. It's a walking air. You've probably seen or you have your athletes do this all the time. But this is a beautiful way of starting the conversation around posture, around organization of limbs and joints, around movement signature, around timing. So this is an athlete that I've, I've coached for a while and she moves very well, which is why I have her in this video. But there's some really interesting lessons here that we can look at and teach with such a simple movement. One of those is foot placement. I'm really, really big on how the foot gets loaded through the ground. And I think it's something that can go anywhere from important to sprinting, as I said, to bobsled, to anything from gymnastics or even basketball. And if you don't load well through your foot and your ankle, that is then going to get passed through the body in a poor movement signature. And I'll give you some more examples of that when we get to a couple of other drills. But the foot placement underneath the hip is such an important part of establishing these good mechanics. The further in front the body of the body, the foot strike is, the more you're going to be loading up ways that you don't want through the body. The last thing I'll mention around this drill is just the timing of arms and hips. So you can see here with this athlete, there's a really nice connection of movement with the shoulder and the hip. Both start and stop at very similar times. And it's a great way of seeing how an athlete moves. Now, I might spend weeks just walking, literally just walking, trying to organize these joints well, trying to load the body well um, with, with foot contact, etc. Once we've sort of moved on from that, we can start doing some slightly more complex movements like this B walk. So the B walk, I see get butchered all the time. There's still an opportunity here to have a full foot contact with the ground. When that full foot is in contact with the ground, you get much better engagement through the posterior chain. Glutes get switched on, hamstrings are engaged. The more you go onto your toes, the more you lose connection through that posterior chain. I'll say that again. The more you're on your toes, the more you lose contact with and connection with that posterior chain. Now that's not to say they're going to sprint like this, but when you're establishing good mechanics, it's really important to be mindful of where you are as far as the speed of movement. And walking drills should be always full foot contact on the ground. That's in my opinion and my experience. Okay, so the second thing we can see here with the B walk is what happens to the posture? Now, you'll see here with this athlete, her torso tends to get drawn forward just a little bit. Now, I know that she's very flexible, so it's not because she's got tight hamstrings, but it's more of a motor control issue. So she's not got quite enough tension through the front of her body, and that's affecting how much she's reaching for with that movement. Would I cue her out of that? Maybe, or I might just let her go for that day. But there's some small changes there that I think could be done a little bit better. So once we've established some of these good walking drills, we can start to load it up with some more complexity. So this is a pretty complex version of the A position. Um, this particular athlete, uh, Ella Nelson, she's a, an Australian 200 meter runner. She was very close to making the 200 meter final at the Olympics in Rio 2016. And she, her strength was always this timing of body positions. Not a super strong athlete, didn't lift that much in the weight room, but she could she time things perfectly and really, really well. Now, as I said, this is a fairly complex movement, but what you can see here, which is the most important part, is where all the limbs start and finish timing-wise. So you can see when that foot comes back down on the ground, you've got a really nice extension of the arms, and all those positions are being hit right at the end. Now, as far as how this would work in a workout, we might do six, seven, eight reps of these over 20, 30, 40 meters. And for athletes that have done a session like this, this is a really hard workout. And you might not be moving quickly just yet, but establishing these good mechanics and these positions is really, really important to be able to build in the speed and build in the more complex movements when you're actually moving more quickly. So another really, really cool movement that I do with literally every athlete that I have is called dribbling. So this is Josh. Josh is a basketball player. He's recently moved down to Harvard 
uh, on scholarship, one of the better high school players from last year in Canada. And he came to me with not being able to run for basically a year. He had patella tendon issues on both his knees. And it was because he was loading up so much through his quads. He ran on his toes. He was constantly moving around the court and just all quads, all quads, all quads. So all I did was just start to have him full foot contact on the ground and start to move a little bit more fluidly through his stride. And this, so this particular dribble is called a dribble over the calf. There's three heights of dribbles you can do. You can do a small one over the ankle. This is the middle one in between, so it's over the calf. And you can do one over the knee as well. And you can do combinations of those within a session, um, depending on what you want out of the workout. If you're looking for a plan B or some kind of a workout where you're rehabbing an athlete from previous injury or like the example I mentioned before with Aries where he'd done some damage to his hamstring. Um, this is a great plan B workout as well as a really good way of establishing good mechanics whilst an athlete's returning from injury. And this can be done very, really, really early on in a lot of rehab, rehabilitation protocols. Um, and it's great because it's essentially running in a small, small movement, a small motion. So as I said, almost all athletes that I work with, I will get to dribble. I think it's a really important um, aspect of, uh, of sprinting. So this is a, an interesting um, topic of conversation and something that I've talked a lot about with, uh, with, with high level um, track and field coaches. And obviously all athletes move differently and they sprint differently, get around the court differently, get around the field differently. And have these constant conversations, arguments, if you like, around if there is an ideal form of sprinting, you know, is there, is there one model that is just everyone should be trying to emulate to get there? And there's some really cool research that's come out of these French authors. And they looked at basically two different styles of movement, um, a terrestrial athlete and an aerial athlete. Um, for the strength conditioning coaches that are out there listening, um, you, we often talk about sort of particular movement patterns in the weight room that, are, that, are, um, that certain athletes do better at. So for example, um, certain athletes might be really good at a squat, but not so good at a deadlift. And they might be what we call a good pusher, but not a good puller. And those movement patterns, um, sometimes we think that they're something that we should fix, something we should look differently at. You know, if an athlete just tends to spend more time on the ground, then we should be getting them off the ground, you know. But what these researchers found was that the preferred strategy of being a terrestrial athlete that spends more time on the ground or an aerial athlete that spends time off the ground, um, it's actually just individual to them. And there's no necessarily, uh, this is the right way to do it. And this is the wrong way to do it. And so that kind of then begs more questions around, okay, so then how do I coach the athletes that I have? Um, am I just getting them to do things they do really well? Or am I trying to build, am I trying to bridge those gaps in, in, movement, in movements and things that they don't do particularly well? And I mean, I guess the answer for me and my experience is it depends. Um, I want to show you a couple of athletes that I've worked with a lot in the past in a second. Um, but I think it really does beg the question around what it is you're doing and what it is you're trying to get from a workout. So talking to some really high level strength coaches around this idea of how to condition athletes that are more ground based and more kind of pushing athletes, the ones that like to squat and spend time on the ground, you know, do we just get them to squat all year uh, or do we start trying to give them some other patterns as well? And I like, um, I, I like the idea that, that was recently put to me that essentially in the early stages of the season, you want to create a really broad sort of movement pattern library. So give the athletes more tools in their toolbox to use. So for the athlete that likes to squat, get them to squat, of course, but also get them to do deadlifts, get them to do power cleans, get them to do more posterior chain work. But the important thing I think for this is when we get to the pointy end of the season, when we want athletes doing a really good job, um, a big game, a big competition, a big race, whatever it might be, you want to give them patterns and you want to give them exercises and things that they are good at. So for a terrestrial athlete that likes spending time on the ground, get them squatting, get them squatting heavy, get them doing things that they know that are going to give them confidence. As opposed to the other athletes that are aerial athletes, 
get them doing bounds, get them doing springy work that makes the most of their very fascial network, which I'll talk about in a second. We've got a couple of athletes here, and I want you to kind of look at these patterns. I'll show you this video a few times, and I want you to see if you can kind of pick up what kind of an athlete it is. So the, the, the easiest way to see if an athlete is more of a terrestrial or an aerial athlete is basically how much their head moves. So an aerial athlete, you'll see quite a lot of bopping up and down. You'll see them connecting with the ground in a slightly different way. Um, and if you had a stopwatch or if you had some very uh, high-speed camera work, you might be able to actually time how long they're spending on the ground. Um, that's the, the biggest giveaway for a third terrestrial and aerial athlete. So I'll come back to this guy in a second, but I'll, I'll show you the second athlete. Both, bo both bobsledders, by the way, and both uh, competed on the world stage. So I wonder if you can see there the difference. I'll show this one a couple more times. Hopefully it's relatively obvious. I know there's a lot of subtleties in some of these movements, but here we're looking at an athlete, especially when he gets upright, it seems it's pretty clear to me what sort of athlete he is. Um, so back to the first athlete, I'll show you him again. And one more, the second one. Okay, hopefully you can see the bounce on that second athlete. So the second athlete came from a track background, um, 110 meter hurdler, strong, powerful. And these aerial athletes tend to be what we call fascial athletes. So their connective tissue is very, very springy. Um, they tend to do really well with plyometric work. They tend to do well with bounding work and they tend to be good with posterior chain work. So they usually like doing single leg and double leg work, but you know, hand cleans, power cleans, um, deadlifts, those sorts of things. And so for this athlete that, uh, that we just showed that is the aerial athlete, I want to get him doing close to the competition stuff that's going to accentuate these patterns that he, he tends to gravitate towards. So I'm going to give him fast work. I'm going to get him like lots of top end work, lots of elastic strength work, as opposed to previous athlete who came from a football background, loves spending time on the ground. He loves to squat, loves to lift heavy. I'm going to give him squats. I'm going to have that guy spend time on the ground and really play to his strengths. And I think this is an interesting conversation around conditioning and how we look at athletes um, and how we sort of program for them. And yes, you want to bridge gaps of their weaknesses, but you really want to make sure that they're able to um, apply their strengths at the same time. It's a super important um, aspect of how we periodize and how we sort of approach different athlete profiles and the very individual nature that athletes are. So at the end of the day, we really want an athlete to look like this. So this is a beautiful video I love of an athlete, Amir Webb. He uh, is a nine, nine, 200-meter runner and a 1985 200-meter runner. Incredibly fast and just one of the best movers I've seen. It's nice to kind of slow things down a little bit and see what kind of an athlete he is. Hopefully you can see, especially from the last couple of videos, what his tendency is, which is an aerial athlete. He's very bouncy, incredibly fascial athlete, very springy, does really well in box jumps, etc. If you can coach an athlete and get them to look like this, you're doing a really good job. <laughs> and that's a product of uh, Stu McMillan. Um, he did a really great job with Amir. And Amir was fifth at the, at the Olympic Games in 2016 as well. And I thought I'd quite, I might mention just what, this, the, the session that he's doing right now is, and this is a wicket session. So we mentioned before around the acceleration sessions as opposed to the upright running sessions. And usually I'll start with the upright running sessions. I find that's easier for an athlete to gain context on what they're doing upright before they start doing acceleration work. Acceleration work is relatively complex and it's a little bit harder for um, athletes to, to naturally and instinctively um, engage in. Wickets are a really good session to do as an in-between. So what um, the guys down at Altus and, and Stu and Dan do is actually have these wickets set up so each one gets a little bit longer to a point. So they're coming out of their acceleration and <clears throat> 
each of these wickets gives the athlete the context and the cue to pick their feet up, even though it's a very small little sort of hurdle, little wicket. Um, it gives them a great opportunity to pick their feet up and, and almost unconsciously. It's not like you have to cue them to do it because there's something physically there to give them that sort of awareness of picking their feet up. But as the wickets get a little bit longer on each stride, it's a really nice way of bridging the acceleration work to the upright running work. I'll just show you one more time because I just, <laughs> he's such a great mover. I think he's great. Okay, so I, I, I kind of want to tie things up with um, something pretty, uh, pretty special. And, and this is uh, this next slide is literally the greatest thing I've ever seen in, in track and field or, or any sport, to, to, as a matter of fact. And there's a few sort of facets to it. Um, I won't give you too much information just yet, but uh, I'm going to show you a video. Uh, it's a pole vault video, and then. I'll talk to you about why it was so special and, and how it really sort of ties in all the things I've been talking about today in this session. So this is uh, Steve Hooker. Um, he is an Australian pole vaulter. This is in 2009. And this is five meters 90. And it is the winning jump of that competition. It's the Berlin World Championships. I was lucky enough to be there sitting pretty close to where this camera is set up. And Steve's a very good friend of mine, so I had some uh, vested interest in his performance. But he broke the uh, championship record and he won that public competition, which is great. And I mean, a world championship is, uh, is, is nothing to be sort of um, poo pooed at, but I'm going to show you why this is so special. So, this is a uh, basically the, the scorecard of that pole vault competition. Uh, for those who haven't seen this sort of scorecard before, uh, we've got the athlete names on the left there and the placing that they came. So there's Steve at the top there, his final performance, which was 590. And then in these little areas here, we've got obviously the, dis the, the heights that they jumped and a bunch of X's and O's. Now, uh, an O is a successful attempt and an X is an unsuc unsuccessful attempt. And so the way that pole vault works is you basically get three attempts at any height. Um, as you can see here with Alexander Straub, he, he missed one and then he got it and then he missed one and he got it and then he had three failed attempts. Um, so just before I kind of give you the reason why this is so special, I just want you to take a look at what Steve did in this competition. And you kind of, you might notice something a little bit weird about his, his scorecard here. Um, and you might notice that there's not much happening in these distances, in these heights beforehand. Um, uh, if, if any of you follow track and field, you notice uh, Renault Lavillani is, is, is in there. He came third and he's the current board record holder. Um, sorry, he, he was the board record holder for pole vault. Incredible pole vaulter. Um, and even he started at 550. So you may be asking the question, why, where was Steve for this part of competition? And the answer is the day before he tore his adductor. He had an adductor tear the day before the World Championship competition. And the incredible part about this story was that his coach told him not to jump in the final. He thought that he basically would completely tear the, the adductor beyond repair. Um, it was a year after he'd made the, uh, after he'd won the Olympic Games in 2008. And so there wasn't really any real reason to prove himself. Um, but Steve had an incredible sports medicine um, and sports science network around him. And he had really good coaches. And the fact that he moved so incredibly well and he had a really good therapist that knew exactly what it was that he needed and what his limitations were on that particular day, the final day. And basically they came up with a strategy. They said, look, I know that I've only got two jumps in me. Maybe, could only be one. So I need to make every I, I need to wait until the final round when everyone else is basically out of the competition well, that's where i come in and i try and win and to do what he did literally win a world championships in two jumps it's never happened before and i'm pretty sure it'll never happen again and um that really does bring together all the things i'm talking about with how these things affect a daily training environment for an athlete and how these elements of therapy and biomechanics 
affect the performance at the end of the day of of an athlete. Um, so I think I think that's uh, I think I've timed that pretty well. Um, I'll happily open up to any questions. Um, uh, if you don't have any questions right now, but have any future questions, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, I'm fairly new to Toronto and to Canada, um, and I'm really trying to network as well as uh, talk to people that you know have got similar questions and, and and really sort of keen to learn from each other. So if if you do if you're in that space and you want to reach out, please uh, please don't hesitate to reach out. There's my Instagram handle there as well, um, and then on the right there is my my two besties. It's my uh, my dog Duke and my wife Melina. And, they're basically the reason why I'm here in Toronto. So um, thanks so much for your time, everyone. And uh, hopefully there's some, some, some questions we can talk about. Awesome. Thank you so much, Brendan. And yeah, cute dog, by the way. Um, the, <laughs> thanks. The, uh, the chat uh, is definitely um, very, very active. Uh, lots of great comments in here. Uh, people uh, definitely uh, thanking you for the session. Great session, great content. A few comments that stood out to me, um, uh, someone mentioned early on, finally someone looks beyond the source, uh, the sore point for the actual causative area. As a retired physio, it's music to my ears, she said. Mm -hmm. uh, another person talked about uh, connecting physiology and that biomechanics to actual real speak. And then another comment in here was, um, who would have thought I would have learned so much about baseball and softball from lessons learned from gymnastics to bobsled. So people are certainly <laughs> connecting with your presentation. So thank you so much. Um, there is lots of questions. Um, uh, going into the, the, so the dribbles section, there was a bunch mm -hmm. of questions. Um, okay. The first one I'll ask is, uh, do you supplement Josh's patellar tendonitis with therapy as well as a stretching program or was it based on just the biomechanical redevelopment. Yeah, great, great question. And um, if it was 18 months ago, I certainly would have had my table there ready to go for the sessions. But um, I only started working with him last year, so we were forced to be outside. And I, uh, I had my mask on, and I was always uh, hands off. Which, um, if I had the ability to do work on on Josh during a session. 100% I would have done a lot of work through hips. He was uh, always tight through his hips. Um, and certainly the tone through his quads was a, a big part of why those patella tendons were getting so overloaded. So in a normal environment, I certainly would have done a lot of therapy as well as that sort of reconditioning work. Um, but unfortunately, just with the circumstances of the last 12 months, I wasn't able to. Awesome. There was a quick question in that section too around, could you just repeat the three types of dribbles? Uh, any, anything specific? Absolutely. Um, I, I, <laughs> I wish I had a, a little, uh, a little doll or something. Um, so the three, it basically it's three heights of dribbles. So there's a dribble over the calf, a dribble over the ankle and then over the knee. So usually we start with over the ankle. So if you were to imagine this was my ankle, um, the other foot would be cycling around the ankle joint. And it's almost like you're basically riding a small little tiny bicycle. Um, and you're very much trying to find a cyclical motion with that. Funnily enough, the smaller movements are often what people struggle with the most. So over the calf is the next height. And it's literally that foot picking up and going about where the middle, midpoint of the calf would be. Um, that's the height that most people get because it's so close to kind of running and jogging. And then the third is over the knee. So that it would look almost like a high knee, but a high knee with a cycle. So you're still trying to find that cyclical motion of the foot um, by trying to bring it to a larger range of motion. Now, the thing that I might mention as well is that you can vary speeds as much as you want with this. So like you might have a really fast ankle dribble, um, or you might have a really slow over the knee dribble. It's harder to go slow when you've got bigger ranges of motion, obviously, but um, it certainly is, uh, there's lots of bandwidth to be able to use any of those three dribbles. And for the people that are really curious around the dribble, I've got plenty of videos, so please email me and I can send you a Dropbox link with a bunch of stuff to look at and to give some context around those three different heights. Fantastic. No, that, that was your visual there with the, with the hand and the ankle kind of thing. Has that really helped? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, another, I think this is a quick one for you. It's in the, it's, a, it's around the physio um, area that you spent some time talking about therapy and track site therapy and things like that. But it was a quick question, I think, around um, is the rice method uh, largely disregarded now for treating injuries? Would you like me to comment on that? Was that That's the question? The question. Yeah, they're asking for your <laughs> yeah. opinion, yes. Well, uh, I, I'm aware of that, and, and I think that um, I probably should have explained it a little bit better because the two sort of scenarios that I was looking at with um, sort of the best case scenario in my personal view and then what was done before, that was what was done before was very much the old school mentality. So it's not something that I personally tell athletes to do if they are hurt. I certainly wouldn't do that. Um, it was, I guess, giving give you an example of what we kind of used to think, what we used to do and how we used to approach things when, when athletes were hurt. Awesome. Got some time for a couple more here and there's certainly no shortage of questions. So uh, I'm gonna keep going through a couple more here. The next one is uh, what is your stance uh, on the previous research and current findings with hypoxic training I mean, the benefits and strength gains, not just cardiovascular, i.e. for power athletes and speed, not just endurance. Um, I don't see, I've, in the speed power athletes that I've worked with, I have not seen it be of any benefit at all. Um, uh, to reduce the amount of oxygen available to an athlete, especially a speed power athlete, that's not really a stimulus that I see as being um, uh, useful for an athlete in, in that sort of environment. Certainly in endurance spaces, I think it's, it's sometimes very helpful, um, whether it be with the altitude training or within hypoxic tents or within the masks even. Um, I've seen very varying results with, uh, with that. Um, some of the programs that I've seen use it really well are the uh, this race walking group in, at the RAS, led by Brett Valance. Um, Brent's done some really, really good um, work in this space. And he's probably one of the groups that I've seen do hypoxic training really well. Um, as of back to my athletic days, we did a little test run of, um, of 400 meter runners because it was an event group that we didn't really, there wasn't really much research on um, on, uh, on whether it was going to be helpful for 400 meter runners. And so we got, um, we got basically the, the best, I think it was about six 400 meter runners in the country at the time to go and spend um, three weeks in simulated altitude training at the RAS. And unfortunately we kind of screwed the study up by training too hard. <laughs> you, get, <laughs> you get six 400 meter runners that are training together in the same space, living together. and we were all just completely wiped out. So we found that for events, at least you know, from my experience and the research that we did, um, events that are under 400 meters or under 800 meters, it wasn't that much benefit. We came out of that, that three week period with really good capacity to train, um, but we didn't actually perform that well when it came to like a, an all-out sort of race and all-out performance. So I hope that answers it fairly well. It's yeah, I've had mixed, I've had mixed sort of uh, mixed results. Um, but certainly don't see any benefit for um, uh, for speed power athletes. Awesome, great. Um, there's two more here, so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna combine combine like three into one here. Um, okay. Yeah. And then there'll be one more question after this, and then we'll wrap it up there. So the next group is, uh, I'm going to say it's related to, um, you know, transferable skills to other sports from the things that you were talking about today. So the first one was around one-sided sports. So things like baseball, softball with throwing and swinging, volleyball with spiking and serving, soccer with kicking. So any advice on drills that they could do for like one-sided types of uh, things? And then also a question around like this work being translated onto ice, so hockey movements and, and that type of thing. And the last question in that area, I think, was around um, do you have any acceleration full uh, stop drills type things? So, okay. <laughs> there's a lot in there. Trying to, trying to make sure we hit everyone's questions here. Um, no worries. So, can you, the first question again, please. First one was the one-sided sports. One um, then... 
So uh, I, I'll actually go back. Can you still see my screen okay? Absolutely. Okay, so I'm going to go back to um, a video with the basketball that I work with. So you'll notice something pretty obvious with him when he's starting off, um, which is his left hand. And he really cradles that left hand, and that's because it's his shooting hand. Now, we spoke mm -hmm. quite a lot about whether that was acceptable, whether it was something that was okay. Um, and when, I, when I, I'm doing sprint drills with, with, with Josh, um, I certainly tried to get him to open up through that side. So I think it's easy when you're doing sprint drills to be as, you know, to cue symmetry and to be as symmetric as possible. Um, I think if I'm trying to read into the question a little bit, um, when you've got athletes that are doing something like baseball or javelin or a single arm sort of sport, uh, it's really about the conditioning. And, and the, most, the most important sort of concept that I found around that was doing things with counter rotation. So a lot of these, uh, single arm sports, single leg sports, they've got very overdeveloped sort of fascial slings that are in a rotational sort of aspect. Um, and so making sure that you have athletes that do the rotation uh, direction that they do within their sport, but also the other way as well is a really important way. And, and I, I feel like the rotation side of things is the most important part of that. Uh, and again, it sort of ties in that that connection with the rest of the body, um, the sequence of events as far as muscle contraction time and all sorts of things, um, as opposed to just doing, okay, like my right arm is my throwing arm, I'm just going to do a bunch of left arm sort of chest press. It really is more about the rotational things that start to come up in, in, in the body. And I'll, I'm going to add a quick story around that with one of my, um, my first sort of therapy mentors who worked with a really high level um, uh, a golf player and this golf player was in town and needed help and this particular therapist was um, well regarded and so this guy came in had incredible back pain and it was it was it was awful and, and he was struggling a lot and basically the therapist said okay well your t-spine is incredibly stiff and so he did a whole bunch of work you know abdominal fascia and trying to um, open up the joints through the t-spine guy got off the table felt amazing came back the next day cursing this therapist he was really really angry because he went out and shot like crap and it was basically because he had changed this athlete system to the point where he had a greater range of motion and I, the reason i tell that story is not because you don't want to treat asymmetries but just understand that treating them in context is important and if you treat like say josh for example i'm not going to touch his shoulder on a game day I would never do anything to change the way that his system um, was organizing itself before something as important as, you know, the finite movement of shooting a basketball. So I guess, you know, to put that in a little bit of context, I think it's important to understand that, yes, you want to have you know, symmetry with movement to avoid injury and increase performance, but know what the right time is to do that. Um, what was the next question? Sorry, Jeremy. Uh, the ice, translating it to ice movements, fading, I would assume. Um, so one of the drills that I, I, I didn't put in, which I think is a, a really good drill that, that I like doing, is, is um, some backwards movements and some sideways movements. I really try and create a, a fairly three-dimensional approach to the, the conditioning and the drills that I do. And something as simple as a sidestep with a crossover, doing both directions and doing forward and back, and having a really controlled environment um, is a really nice way of learning how to apply force in not only the um, sagittal plane, but frontal plane as well. Um, I have worked directly conditioning wise with many um, uh, ice hockey athletes. I treated a couple just to kind of um, had them move better, um, but I haven't, I haven't had the pleasure yet of working with many ice hockey athletes. Uh, as, in terms of transferring to the isoskeleton and bobsled, it's really easy because you've got spikes on, so you've got a, a firm foot placement. Um, but what I would say, if I ever had the opportunity to work with, with hockey players, is getting them to apply force in all different planes and have them confident with those movements before sort of adding the complex the, the complexity of putting them on, on ice. Right. And this is the last one here, and then we will uh, wrap it up. So the last question is, are there resources available to explore the terrestrial versus aerial athlete concept? Absolutely. Um, uh, email me and I will send you 
uh, I've got about three or four articles, um, and there is a particular uh, assessment tool. Um, I'm going to mess the name up, but it's Von Dahlen or Vodalen, I think is what it's called. Um, and it's basically a five, uh, a five uh, category sort of assessment where you look at five different aspects of how they're moving, and that can help you direct um, where you want to go with that, uh, categorizing that athlete. But um, I can send you the articles that I have um, for that person who asked, so please uh, email Thank me you. and I'll send you what I have. Thank you so much, Brendan. This has been awesome. I believe we got through almost all the questions. So uh, thank you for, for all of your time today. Thank you for your expertise, sharing it with all the coaches here uh, today in our second session of the day. So um, and thanks to all the coaches uh, for attending. Uh, the next and the last session of the Ontario Coaches Conference 21 takes place tonight at 7 p.m., where we will be joining um, the Team Canada, the number one world ranked team in beach volleyball, the duo of Sarah Pavin and Melissa Humana Paradis and their coach, Brian McDonald, and talking about how they deal with the uncertainty of preparing for gold at Tokyo 2021. So, uh, and just a note that if you've missed any past sessions, you can review the recordings uh, by clicking on the individual sessions in the hub. And we will also be making these uh, videos accessible for 30 days post-conference. Um, and we'll also make the videos available through public links so that you can watch outside the hub uh, after that. So uh, you will get an email to confirm all this as well. So I will wrap it up there. Thank you all. And we hope to see you tonight at the session at 7 p.m. Have a good day, everybody. Be safe.